The scriptures tell us of the importance of studying God's word. The psalmist writes, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy path. In another place, he continues, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. We at Calvary Chapel Worship Center believe in teaching through the Bible in its entirety. May your faith be increased at the hearing of God's Word. Here now is Pastor Rich. All right, we are back, everybody. Go ahead and have a seat if you do that. And let's take our Bibles, please, and open to 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Kings 5, verse 1, titled is, Naaman is Healed. Very important story, a lot of personal application. Let's ask the Lord's blessing. Father, we now look to your word. Pray that you would bless by your Holy Spirit. Pour out the spirit of life into our hearts because, Lord, we come with a teachable heart and a desire to learn, to grow, to be transformed. Pour out that life to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, in 2 Kings 5, we are introduced to a man named Naaman. He's not a Hebrew. Uh, he is actually Syrian. And uh, so it's an interesting story because it starts out in this country of Aram, kind of in the north and east. And it's interesting because we're told that he is a highly respected man in the eyes of the king of Syria, king of Aram, a valiant warrior. And uh, even the scripture tells us that he was used of the Lord to bring a victory to Syria when God wanted to bring a victory there. We presume this was due to Israel's hard heart. But God used this man, uh, many presume, and I think rightly so, that he could be the highest commander of the Syrian forces, some general, uh, and uh, yet he had a real issue in his life. Valiant man, great warrior, high lifted up, posture, stature, everything, but he had a problem. He was a leper. And can you imagine just for a moment, all of this, you know, prestige and all of the position and all the power, and yet he's a leper. And it's an interesting thing, you know, highly successful guy, right? You know, self-motivated, you know, self-assured, self-disciplined, you know, self-sacrificing, but all of that would not help him with his leprosy. Now, you know, interesting thing about leprosy, it is a study unto itself. Leprosy, debilitating disease that affects the nervous system of all, uh, amongst other things. So what would happen is that a person would start to lose their feeling in their toes, uh, their fingers, their extremities, their nose, for example. And uh, after a while, you would see a shriveling kind of a deformity that would come, and the, then the uh, the decay would start, and it, the loss of the, of, the, of the feeling would be such that if, a, and this is kind of gross, okay, but if a rat started gnawing on someone's fingers, they wouldn't feel it, or their toes, they'd just lose their toes. Uh, if there was grit or sand in the eyes, they wouldn't feel it, and so they would get blind. So this is a greatly feared disease, incurable, incurable, uh, debilitating, greatly feared, uh, is leprosy around today. It is around today still. It's called Hansen's disease. Uh, it's not very common in the United States, maybe just uh, less than 200 cases a year. Um, however, around the world, uh, several hundred thousand cases, most of those are in India, frankly. Um, it can be completely halted today with advanced medicine. Uh, it cannot be reversed. The effects of it, the devastating effects cannot be healed, cannot be reversed. But it can be halted, although it's interesting. Uh, it's called Hansen disease because this man Hansen discovered that it was caused by a bacterium, although highly resistant. And in fact, the only known antibiotic became absolutely, totally ineffective because it, uh, it became resistant to it. The only way to attack it today is a multi-drug therapy that may take more than two years to be effective. And it is still today uh, highly feared uh, of a disease, incurable, fatal, back in that time. And so uh, in the Old Testament, leprosy became a picture of sin. And we can understand why. Uh, sin is fatal. It is progressive. We understand that sin, of course, progressively takes more and more and more of the life. It's contagious. And I think now there's a picture of sin. We understand that, don't we? 
I mean, if you, if you have kids, you know how important it is that your kids pick right friends because the friends that they choose to hang out with will greatly affect who they become because we know this is how it is. Amen? And so we know it's contagious. that They start hanging out with partiers and all this sort of thing. We know it's going to affect them. It's contagious. And so it's a great picture of sin because of that. And, of course, it's fatal. Mortal in its fatality. And so here we see uh, a Naaman. And uh, it's interesting because the Old Testament gives a provision to the priests saying, if a man should ever be healed of leprosy, this is the sacrifice that you should you know, give to them. But the thing is, it's incurable. So they were given instruction for the curing of leprosy that was incurable. So this is an interesting thing. And it's also interesting that in the Old Testament, no one was ever healed of leprosy. And thus, that Leviticus never was applied. Well, with the exception, of course, Naaman, but he's a Syrian. So it's an interesting story. We begin in chapter 5, verse 1. Now, this is important before we look at the verses. It's important to understand that as many things in the Old Testament do, here it also does. It is a shadow of some greater truth, a greater reality. What does it do? It points us to Jesus Christ. Here there is a shadow of Jesus Christ that is revealed to us for the reality of Christ is wonderful and amazing. And they gave an insight here into who he is and was. All right, chapter 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, who was captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master and the highly respected because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now the man was a valiant warrior but he was a leper. Now, the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife, little girl. It's an interesting part of the story. So, the little girl said to her mistress, Oh, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. I like this little girl. I don't know how old she is, but she's a little girl, so we have to assume that she's pretty young. And here, I think we get just a little insight into the benefit of raising our children in spiritual truths. For here she was taken from her family, but she's got a hold of spiritual truths, even as a little girl. And she testifies of who God is and speaks of this great prophet. You know, oh, if my master could only know that there's a prophet in Israel. And so interestingly, this little girl's testimony is rushed right up to the king. It tells us in verse 4, Naaman went in and he told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Well, when the king of Aram heard it, he said, Well, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and he took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand talents or shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. This is a lot of money. He's sending millions of dollars worth of, of gold and silver and all this clothes, which was very valuable at the time, uh, because they want this man. He's a very important guy, and they need him to be healed. So, verse 6, he brought the letter to the king of Israel. Now, can you imagine the king of Israel, the northern kingdom? They weren't exactly following the Lord, okay? And so you can imagine the king, he gets this letter from the king of Aram. What is this? And this is what the letter said. Now, as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman, my servant, to him, to you, so that you may cure him of leprosy. What? You've got to be joking. What is he doing to me? What is he thinking? And in fact, verse 7, it came about when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God? What is he doing to me? Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Now look, consider this. He is seeking a quarrel against me. He's trying to start a fight. And so he's tearing his clothes. He's in such anguish. Okay, so Elisha. Elisha hears this. And verse 8, It happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Apparently you don't know that, but there is a prophet in Israel, and he will soon know that. So Naaman came. So the king Jehoram said, yeah, 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 go, you go to Elisha. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. 
I don't know we can call it a house. He was a, a prophet in those days. They didn't have much. But we might call it a hovel. But here comes Naaman with his horses and his chariots. I mean, you've got to just imagine this scene for just a minute. Naaman is a mighty man, and he's an important guy. I mean, in Syria, which was a significant nation, he's way up there in significance. So when Naaman comes, you know, with his horses, well, that general's going to have his horses all decked out, you know, his chariot's going to be all decked out, his uniform is going to indicate significance and power, right? And so you can always hear the creaking of the leather, you know, and the cheeking of the metals and, and all this sort of thing, you know. And oh, of course, he's got an entourage. You don't go anywhere without an entourage if you are an important person. He's got the whole entourage. He's got silver and gold. He's got a letter from the king of Syria. How important is that? You know, and he comes with the whole thing, and he stands outside of Elisha's house, you know, waiting for the man of God to come out to him. <laughs> you can just see the scene. Elisha doesn't even come out to see him. I love that part. Elisha doesn't even, you know, not coming out. And he sends his servant out with a simple message. Hey, go dip seven times in the Jordan, you'll be healed. Thank you, see you later, bye. <laughs> and so this is, you know, this is what happens. So Naaman, verse 9, came with his horses and his chariot, and he stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. And Elisha simply sent a messenger saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you'll be clean. That's it. Naaman, verse 11, when he heard this, he became furious. And the word here means furious. I mean, he is in a rage. How dare him? How dare him say such a thing, to do such a thing to me? He's, he's furious. He's absolutely in a rage. Naaman is furious, and he went away. He's, he's leaving. Behold, he said, you know what I thought? I thought, he said, that he would come out to me, and he would stand, and he would call on the name of Jehovah his God, and he would wave his hand over the place, wave his hand, you know, and then the leper would be healed. I thought, it's a big thing. He said, dip seven times in the Jordan. Are, are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So I turned away and went in a rage. Now, we can understand that he wasn't too impressed with the Jordan. I mean, if you've ever been to the Jordan... You would, under, you, you would relate to it right away. I mean, you know, if you go to Israel, you want to see the Jordan. And you want to be baptized in the Jordan. I mean, if you're going to go to Israel, you've got to be baptized in the Jordan. I mean, everybody wants to be, right? And we get this image in our mind that the Jordan is like the mighty Columbia. You know, oh, moves through, you know. You get there and you say, is that really the Jordan? That looks more like a creek. What is that? And, and indeed, you know, it's, you stand up to it like here in it, you know. And what? The Jordan? And dip into it, that's it, that's it, that's the whole thing. Well, remember that this is a picture of some greater thing. It's a picture of salvation. He's picturing for us, and there are some deep, wonderful truths here in this very simple little thing. If it's a picture of salvation, then what it pictures for us is that salvation is, the way of salvation is simple. It's easy. In fact, it's so simple and so easy that many people don't like the fact that it's simple and easy. Wants some great thing. You know, here's the thing when you look at this. What was it that he had in his mind? You see, he wanted to be treated like a great man. He was bringing his approach to life into his religion. You know, give me something great to do. Give me some, you know, difficult task of penance. Maybe some mountain to climb. Some goal that can only be accomplished by self-discipline and self-sacrifice. And I will show you what a great man I am. No. You could just simply dip in the Jordan River. What? And so what was it that got in the way of pride? You know, see, salvation, the way of salvation is a simple thing. But pride can stand in the way. Oh, can we ever relate to this? Pride. Oh, how great pride can be in our lives. 
Pride, you know what? Pride almost kept Naaman from the greatest gift that he could ever receive. What was it he wanted more than anything else? He wanted to be cured of his leprosy. And pride almost kept him, almost kept him from the greatest thing that he ever desired. Man, we got to look at that, don't we? we got to look at our own pride. It keeps people from the greatest things that God wants from them. And their pride gets all bothered by things. You know, told seven times to dip in the Jordan River. Are you kidding? Why, the rivers of Damascus, aren't they better? He wanted to be treated like a great man. Because when Naaman came in the room, everybody stood up. You know, he's one of these great men, one of these men of great renown. Naaman's in the room. Oh, everybody stand to your feet. Naaman's here. And he wanted to be treated like a great man. But he wasn't a great man. He was a man with a disease, and it was fatal. And all the greatness and all the grandeur and all the status wouldn't heal him. In fact, it prevented him. It prevented him from the simplest thing. You know, Jesus gave an illustration of this very thing when he taught us how important it is to acknowledge our need, to acknowledge the need that we have. Don't let pride stand in the way of acknowledging the need it's interesting because Jesus came to a man who was a tax gatherer and had the audacity. Jesus had the audacity to call a despicable fellow. At least that's the way people thought of him. He was a tax gatherer. Tax gatherers worked for the government of Rome. And they would collect taxes. And when they would take taxes, they would commonly pad the number so as to increase their own personal wealth. Everybody knew what they were doing they couldn't catch them at it, but they knew they were doing it. And so tax gatherers were despicably hated. Jesus came to a man sitting by in his tax booth. His name was Levi or Matthew. And he, Jesus came up to him and he said, Matthew, come and follow me. He gave him an opportunity. Come follow me. Matthew stood up, left the tax collector's booth, and went with him. He immediately saw an opportunity. And walked with Jesus. But you know what he did? He then called all his tax collector sinner friends and had a dinner with Jesus. He called all his tax collector sinner friends. You've got to meet Jesus. You've got to meet this guy. And so they held this dinner, tax gatherers, sinners, all in a room, you know. And the Pharisees, they take hold of this. They see it and they look into the thing and they become enraged. Who does this man think he is? By eating with sinners. Tax gatherers. Has he no dignity? And in fact, in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners. Well, in truth, everybody's a sinner. In truth, if leprosy is a picture of sin, everybody's got the disease. Everybody's got the same mortality, the same fatality in the disease. It's only when we, oh, we think we're something. You don't, don't see your need? You think you're somebody? And see, the, the mortality of it is important. For Isaiah 64, 6 makes it clear. All of us have become like one who is unclean. Everyone. All of us who become like one who's unclean. And our righteous deeds are like filthy garments or filthy rags. You know, there were many times when Jesus confronted the Pharisees. They need to see the need. Who does he think he is? They're fellowshipping with sinners. But the sinners are the ones who need the help the most. Does anybody know any sinners? They need some help. You know, it's interesting. When I was in the, uh, in the restaurant business, of course, you remember my story last week. I was part owner, partners in a restaurant, and then sold it to become, you know, get into uh, ministry. Went to Bible college, and I was waiting tables as I was going through Bible college. And at one opportunity I had, uh, this small church asked me to come out and give a message. You know, you're in Bible college, come out, you know. And I thought, this is great. Well, the restaurant that I was working at was not open on Sundays, and so I knew that everybody was available. So I said to everybody 
in the crew. I mean, the servers, everybody. I said, hey, look, I want you all to come to church with me on Sunday. I got invited to speak. I want you all to come. And they said, really? You want us to come to church there with you? And I said, yeah, I want all of you to come to church. And, uh, and, and they said, well, are you going to introduce us? I said, oh, absolutely, I'll introduce you. And they said, well, how are you going to introduce us? I said, you guys all sit together in the back row. I'll have you all stand up together and say, hey, everybody, here are my sinner friends. <laughs> and, you know, I was laughing. We're joking. You know, I'm trying to make honest, open relationship, and humor is a good part of that. They all did come to church. <laughs> I didn't introduce them as my sinner friends. But they all came to church. Because who needs to hear it? Who needs to hear it but the sinners that are out there in the world? And so how many people know sinners? I mean, how many people know people who have need? There's a great need, you see, but what we need is the reality. Jesus was confronting the Pharisees because their pride was standing in the way. Man's pride stands in the way from the simplest truth. It almost kept Naaman from the greatest gift that he could have ever had and did finally have. But pride almost stopped him. You know how much pride stops people? Stops people from getting what God really wants them to have. Jesus was confronting the Pharisees, and he said, you remember when John was here, John the Baptist was preaching, he said, tax gatherers and prostitutes came and they heard his message, and they repented. They were transformed because of that. See, he's confronting them now. In fact, notice in Matthew 21, 31, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Woo! That is just pretty sharp right there. But you know something? they got to hear it. He's trying to break through and help them to see it for the reality. See, it's only when we see it that our pride gets down. We all have a fatal disease. It's called sin, and all of our great accomplishments and all of our technological advancements and all the wonderful things that we take such pride in, it can't heal leprosy. I'm talking about the leprosy of the soul. It doesn't address all the technological things, computers that can do this and that. It doesn't address the greatest human need. Only God does that. It's only when we see it. Ever had those moments when you get to the reality point? I remember when we were, when we were uh, ministering in Russia, uh, there were several times when we flew Aeroflot. Aeroflot is the Russian airlines. I'm telling you, there is massive revivals on Aeroflot. <laughs> when you fly Aeroflot, I mean, there is a connection with God right away. It's, oh, God, help me. You know, it's because you, you, there are so many things that happen when you're flying Aeroflot. You've got to start praying, oh, God, be with us now. Because you start to see the reality. You know, it's interesting. I happened to run into Andrew Palau. Many of you know, of course, Luis Palau, his son Andrew. Uh, I was at this luncheon, and I, I said, hey, how are you doing? And, and I looked at his face, and I saw this scar. He hadn't had it before, and it started here, and it kind of worked around his eye like this. I said, Andrew, what happened to your uh, face? And he said, I, I was in that plane crash in Jamaica. You remember a few months ago that plane crash in Jamaica? He said, I was on that plane crash. I said, wow, Andrew. What was that like? It's chaos, pandemonium, you know, you can imagine. He said, but a peace. There was a peace. And I thought, you know, I started thinking about that. And I thought, you know, I wonder how many atheists were on that plane. Maybe they were atheists when they got on that plane, but were they atheists when they got off that plane? Because what they came to see was the reality of their own mortal condition. And when they came face to face with their own mortality, did they keep holding on to it? Did they keep holding on to it? Or would they change their atheism to calling on God at the last moment? You know what I'm convinced? I'm convinced you're going to call out to God. Because when you get down to the bottom and the, whole, the core of the being and they see it for what it is, that's when they get converted. There, we need an honest diagnosis. Naaman was facing his mortality. He knew he had an incurable disease. And pride almost kept him from receiving what he needed the most. Man, we got to see it. We need an honest diagnosis. 
We need an honest diagnosis. And so what was it that the servant of Naaman said to him? Notice in verse 13, his servants came near. He's furious, right? Oh, what is he thinking? He's furious. He leaves in a rage. His servants came near to him and said, my father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Yes, he would have. If he had asked you to climb some mountain, if he had done some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? He said, how much more a small thing? If you would have done a great thing, how much more a small thing? Of course he would have done a great thing, because it would have showed how great he was. You show me some great mountain, you show me some great feet, and I'll show you. I will do that thing, and I will show you how great I am. No, this is not it. It's a simple thing. It's a simple thing. Simply believe. That's it. It's simple. Simply believe. The point here is it's so simple, but you must believe it. And so this is what happens. When the servant said to him, my father, if the, if the prophet had asked you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Why not do this simple thing? Go wash and be clean. So he did it. He went down and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. You can imagine, you know, he's up to here. You know, he's dipping down. This is ridiculous. This dude, come on, there's a three. Seven times, he said, seven times, you're only in five. Keep going. And he said, oh, you know. But finally, in the seventh time, he stands up and he's clean. And it says here, he dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. The flesh, can you imagine the skin of leprosy, which is rotting. And he's now restored like the skin of a little baby. We would say he's soft as a baby's bottom. You know, it's like, oh, it's so wonderful. Can you imagine? I just had this scene, you know, that he comes up, you know, in his face. And all his servants say to him, wow, Naaman, your skin looks like the skin of a little baby. Boosh! You know, you don't say that to a general, right? But so here, here he did it. He simply believed, and his pride was lowered, and he received it. Here, it was just the simplest thing. He wanted to be healed, and so he did the simplest thing. But this simplest thing, this healing, was far beyond his resources. He had all these millions of dollars. It wasn't enough. He had a, a letter from the king. It wasn't enough. The simplest thing, and yet no one could afford it. And interestingly, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah 55. For Jesus, the Lord addresses this in Isaiah 55. Beginning in verse 1. Ho, which means listen to this. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, which is not going to help you, in other words? Why do you spend your wages for what doesn't satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Delight yourself in abundance, and I'll tell you how. Incline your ear. Come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the unrighteous man forsake his unrighteous thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. He will have compassion on him. Let him return to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. He and he alone cures. My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Come, you who have no money. Bye. Need. We have difficulty accepting how simple the grace of God is. Could it be because we don't want to let go of our pride? Could it be that we want to hold on to our pride? Naaman, you know, was a mighty man, an honorable man. No doubt, hardworking man. Surely he had a good work ethic. Now, is there anything wrong with any of those things? I submit to you there's nothing wrong with any of them. In fact, we would say they're good things. They're fine things to have. But they won't cure you of leprosy. They won't cure you of sin. They can't give you salvation. See, religion 
Many people think that religion is the thing, but religion is about doing. Christianity is about recognizing that it's already done. There's no doing. It's already done. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. It's that simple. You and your household. Then it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. And so we look at this example that Naaman gives to us. And we said before that leprosy is a picture of sin, and this healing of his leprosy is a picture of some greater truth. What is it? It's that we are baptized into Christ. And here's something we need to understand. This is a, it's a simple thing, but there's a great truth behind it. You are saved in Christ. See, many people, they don't understand how we're saved. You know, they, they believe and they're saved. That's true. But isn't it wonderful to know how? How are we saved? You are saved in Christ. You know, Naaman asked an interesting question. Were not the rivers of Damascus better than the rivers of Israel? But it wasn't about whether they were better rivers. It's about that the Jordan is a picture of Jesus Christ. Oh, what about all these other religions? There, there's nothing about those religions that has any significance. This is about Jesus Christ. There's only one name under heaven by which men must be saved because he is God's only begotten son. And so there is the point behind it all. It's not about rivers. It's about Jesus Christ. And so there it is. Why? Because Jesus is the one who heals the leprous soul. It's incurable. See, here's the thing. What about all the religion? What about all the rivers? Well, they won't cure you of leprosy. Go dip in them and try it. They won't do it. It's only because the Jordan is a picture of Jesus Christ. Only he heals the leprous soul. You see, if leprosy is a picture of sin, Jesus is the only one that heals it. That's the only name. That's the only hope. It's important for us to, to see it. You know, in Leviticus 14, we studied that when we went through Leviticus, there were these verses that told the priests what they should do should a man or woman be healed of leprosy, but no one was ever healed. For 1,500 years, since they received that law, for 1,500 years, no one ever, ever applied those verses. Of course, Naaman was healed, but he was a Syrian, so it didn't apply. So, 1,500 years, the priests never did that sacrifice called for in Leviticus 14 for the healing of the leper. That is until Jesus came. When Jesus came, now 1,500 years, no one was healed of leprosy. And then Jesus came, and then all of a sudden, people started getting healed of leprosy left and right. Can you imagine Caiaphas, the high priest? 1,500 years, they had never used Leviticus 14, and all of a sudden, groups of people. Did you know there was 10 people at one time that got healed of leprosy? What, can you imagine Caiaphas? What? Yeah, there's 10 people out here. They all got healed by leprosy. It's a testimony to who he is. The one, the promised one, the Messiah, the one who heals the leprous soul, he's here. It's interesting. In Matthew chapter 8, verse 4, Jesus said to this one, this leper, who he healed, See that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priest, and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Here comes another one. But look at the verses just before it. Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 and 3, for here we get an interesting thing. This leper came to him, and he bowed down before him. Now, can you imagine a leper? Came to Jesus, bowing down, and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. His faith was so clearly seen, don't you think? I know you can touch me. You are able, if you are willing, make me clean. Jesus stretched out his hand. I love this part. Jesus stretched out his hand and he touched him. I am willing. Be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Here's the thing. Does Jesus want to heal your soul? Does Jesus want to transform your life? Answer, oh, absolutely. The question is not whether Jesus wants to. The question is whether you want to. Does pride stand in the way? That's part of leprosy, isn't it? See, here's the thing that we need to understand. 
It's in Christ. It's a simple thing. In Christ we die, and in Christ we live. See, there's the greater reality. There's the wonderful truth of it all. In Christ we die. Well, how does that have any significance? Well, remember what the Scripture says. It tells us that the wages of sin is death. You see, leprosy is fatal. It brings death. The wages of sin is death. That's what it tells us in, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Next, we need to see then that we died because of our sin. We died when we were in Jesus Christ. This is how we were saved. He takes us by the Holy Spirit and He baptizes us into Jesus Christ. Now, let's make something real clear. It's not the water of baptism. We have a baptistry right here. It's not the waters of baptism that saves. It's the Holy Spirit taking us and baptizing us into Jesus Christ. The water, all of that is just a picture of something far greater, a greater reality. It's like communion. Communion is just bread in a cup. But it's a picture of some great reality, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And so baptism is a picture of some great reality. You know what that reality is? That He takes us, the Holy Spirit does, and He places us into Christ so that we were in Him when He died. We're supposed to die. Well, we did die because we were in Him when He died. Notice in Romans 6, verses 3 and 5, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Therefore, we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, If we've been united with Him in the likeness of His death, then we are united with Him in the likeness of His resurrection. In Him we died, and in Him we live. It's like we're born again. Our soul is made, you know, new. It's a wonderful, we've been healed. See, Christ's death then is applied to us, and His life is applied to us. It'd be different if He just stayed in the grave. But He was raised from the dead, so we were with Him in His death, and we were with Him in His life. It was given to us as a gift. I said, can you explain that further? How about this? You know, many of you know that the sin of Adam is actually attributed to each one of us. This is the nature of who we are. That's why we're born in sin, because we were born into Adam's sin. We say, well, I wasn't there when Adam sinned. Well, kind of you were. The Scripture tells us that we were in him when he sinned. We were in his loins, you could say. When he sinned, therefore, it's as if we had sinned. Now, we didn't sin, Adam sinned, but we were in him when he sinned, therefore, it's like we had done it. He said, well, I'm not sure I like that. Well, I understand that. But it's also how we're saved. For not only were we in Adam when he sinned, but now in a similar way spiritually, we are in Jesus Christ when he died. Therefore, now we have been healed From the sin that we had in Adam, we are healed and we are now in Jesus Christ. And so the glorious truth is that now we have all of the righteousness also. Because we were in Him when He was righteous. That's why it tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What a glorious truth. All of the righteousness then of God has been given to us as well. What a wonderful thing. When we step back and we realize the healing that we have and all that it means and the transformation that God is doing in us, it should cause us to to, to say thanks. It should cause us to fall in love with the Lord all over again. Go back to 2 Kings chapter 5. Notice what happened in verse 15. When he returned to the man of God, right? His skin is restored to him. So he goes back to Elisha with all his company. And he came and he stood before him. Behold now, I know, he says, that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. So please take a present from your servant. I want to give you something. I, I just, I'm so thankful. I am so just touched by this whole thing. I want to give you a present. And, and Elisha said, as the Lord lives and before whom I stand, I will take nothing. I didn't heal you. I'm not going to take a gift from you. I, I didn't heal you. And he urged him, please take it, please take it. No, I won't. So Naaman said, well, then if not, please let your servant at least be given two mule loads of earth. I want some dirt. Why would you want some dirt? 
I want some earth, for your servant will no more offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods, but only to Jehovah. I want some earth of Israel. I want to stand. I'm not going to worship anybody else anymore. I want to stand on some dirt of Israel, and then I want to offer God my heart. Now, his theology is not right here, right? But I love his heart. I love his heart. I want to give God something to say thank you. And that's what we should be saying as well. When you realize that he has given you the greatest gift you could ever have, don't you want to say thank you for that? Don't you want to offer him something wonderful? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the free gift, the gracious gift of life. So simple. Yet pride can stand in the way. Lord, I pray this morning that we would recognize that the picture that we received this morning is a picture of the greater things that you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Only you can heal the leprous soul. And we pray this morning that you would pour out that life to us. We lower our pride and see it and recognize it. Church, as we're praying this morning, as we continue to pray, I want to ask a question. If you are here this morning and you have not asked Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, I want to invite you this morning to do that. It's very simple. You simply believe. You ask Him. If you're at the place where you say, Lord, I want to repent of all the things. I want to repent of leprosy. All the things that, that have destroyed me and brought death to my life. And I ask that you would make me whole. Give me eternal life. I lower my pride and I receive that this morning. Would you be one of those who would receive this morning Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? I'm going to ask that you would just raise your hand and just, God bless you, sister. God bless you guys there. Anyone else who would receive Jesus Christ this morning? Several at the first service as well. We just want to honor the Lord in that. Anyone else who would make that decision for the Lord today? God bless you guys. Father, we honor you for everyone who says they want to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It's an honor to recognize that you are the one who heals the leprosy of our soul. You bring the healing. Church, if, we, if you're here this morning, if you would be one of those that would say, but I want to give something to the Lord. I want to give him my heart as a thank you. I know that he's touched me, but I haven't been giving him my heart. I haven't been acknowledging his place in my life that he deserves to have. Would you say that to the Lord this morning? Would you raise your hand and say that to the Lord? I want to give the Lord my heart this, and acknowledge that I haven't been doing that. God bless you guys. God bless each of you as you say that to the Lord. As you say that to the Lord, He will hear you. He will honor His name in your life. Father, thank you for we see in these verses, in this chapter, this encouragement to us, this great, wonderful thing that you've done, and it causes us to love you more. For no one can wash away our sin but you. No one but you. We honor you. We worship you. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name. On behalf of Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, we thank you for ordering this message. Our prayer is that God will use it in your life to increase your knowledge and your love for Him. If we may serve you in any way, please contact our church office at 503-642-2003 or on our website at www.calvaryhillsboro.org. On behalf of all of us at Calvary Chapel Worship Center and Pastor Rich Jones, May God bless you.